Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jen Ward-Clark and I'm thrilled to bring you a lively discussion today which will look at the topic of regenerative agriculture through the lens of what has been coined a sister movement to permaculture. Our topic today is syntropic farming, insights into regenerative agroforestry. If you're joining us for the first time, this is Wired's live living room sessions where twice per week we host a space for disruptive and innovative conversations on climate change, biodiversity, regenerative agriculture, and renewable energy. These sessions are brought to you by Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education, and Design, in collaboration with the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, CPRI, and powered by the Inter-American Development Bank. As we are shifting into phase two of the government of Barbados's COVID-19 strategy, we're looking to you, our viewers, to tell us when would be the best time for our segment as you transition into your new working hours. So be sure to participate in our polls on Instagram and Facebook. It's an easy one click and you can tell us what you think. If you haven't been keeping up with us over the last few weeks, shame on you, but you can always catch the replays on cl by clicking on the videos on either CPRI or Wired's Facebook page. And we're happy to announce that our sessions are now live streaming on YouTube as well. So please subscribe to YouTube's or Wired's YouTube channel, where we will also put up any links that we speak about in our sessions today. Joining us today and to guide us into the world of syntropy, we have Ursula Artsman. Ursula has studied environmental engineering with a focus on sustainability, ecosystem mapping, land use planning, agriculture and forestry. And she also holds a degree in integrated coastal zone management and ecotourism. She has spent nearly two years on a syntropic teaching farm north of Rio in close collaboration with Ernst Gosch, the founder and core teachers of syntropic farming. The team on that farm managed a diversity of systems targeting a variety of different goals, vegetables, fruit, timber, bioremediation, designs optimized for mechanization, and creating documentaries and teaching materials. Ursula also spends several months in Antigua each year, where she planted her first syntropic beds in 2018. She's also the founder of Soul Food Forest Farms, an organization that creates regional teaching and support centers to transition farms from conventional to, trans to syntropic farming. I'm sure that you're all eager to uh, join me in welcoming Ursula to the session. So Ursula, welcome. Hey, good afternoon. good afternoon. Welcome. Hi to the Caribbean and the rest of the world. Yes, and you're joining us from? I'm joining in from Switzerland currently. That's where I got stuck in my travels. <laughs> <laughs> so Ursula, to get started, um, much of what you do and what you have done is so applicable to us here in Barbados and across the Caribbean. Um, I personally have been following and educating myself about syntropy for the last half a year or so. Uh, and the parallels to permaculture and biodynamic farming are the selling point to me. Um, I know that for many of our viewers, learning about your work in the Caribbean in particular is going to be of, of great interest. So to start with, we'd love to hear a bit about your story. Can you tell us about your journey in regenerative agriculture and the path that led you towards syntropic farming? Of course I can. Um, it actually sort of started in the Caribbean in 1989 uh, where I started working on farms and I was always intrigued about the hard work and, and the way people are farming in the Caribbean in a enclosed space, an island that has limited resources. So whenever you do something positive, it has a huge effect on the whole ecosystem, on the whole mm -hmm. cultural system mm -hmm. of an island. And it also has a huge effect if you do negative things to the environment and to the people because you're, you're just having this island. And... Um, when I studied uh, environmental engineering, to me, it was very clear there must be more than organic farming because organic farming is still very limited to um, monocrop production. It's still very depending for, uh, to, on, on, on inputs and, and stuff like this. So I was starting to search on my journey after the study and I found permaculture, which to me is already a very advanced and uh, very holistic um, viewpoint on designing systems, on designing livelihoods for people with food production. Yet I was not convinced 100% yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I was missing the, the large-scale approach. I was missing um, probably even a more, a more um, regenerative 
aspect on on a on a bigger scale and and I sort of was was sad to see that it was not really seen globally with permaculture. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same moment, I stumbled over the work of Ernst Gutsch. He's a Swiss farmer uh, originally, and he has been working in plant genetics. And he was modifying mm -hmm. plants to grow in very harsh conditions, which actually have been caused by the mistreating uh, techniques that we humans used. So we degrade land, right. So we degrade land and then we try to modify the plants in order to survive and still produce yields. And I was intrigued that he then turned it around and said, why don't we not just create conditions for plants that have evolved over millions of years mm -hmm. and just create their perfect conditions as in nature to thrive mm -hmm. instead of manipulating. Some and that was sort of looking at creating the conditions as opposed to exactly creating... yes mm -hmm. exactly and that uh, was leading me actually in his first workshop um, or in a first workshop with him directly and i then got invited to come to brazil and uh, i spent two years on this 160 hectare farm which to me was mind-blowing because you could see systems in all varieties and um, in all stages of development, and then it became very clear how abundant those systems are, how how rich in species and food, and and if you walk in, you have animals and birds and bees and everything. It is it's a life system. You you very quickly realize it is a living, thriving ecosystem, and mm -hmm. provides food in abundance. So it's so. <laughs> so <Yeah>. we've, touched <laughs> on, <laughs> we've touched on a bit of what you've done the, the, the systems that um, you create that we've touched on words like biodiversity um, yes usually people will know what um, organic gardening is the title of today's session even so uh, regenerative agroforestry it can be a bit daunting for some farmers who are thinking yes. you know regenerative agroforestry I just want to grow some yams um, can, can we elaborate a little bit on some of the terminology that is that uh, Syntropy brings with it? So the difference, of, yes. I guess, between conventional agriculture and what we would call regenerative agroforestry, which encompasses a lot of different principles. So uh, Syntropy being one, permaculture being another, biodynamic farming being a third. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we were confronted a lot by this question, why is there even another type of farming? Why is it even called differently? Isn't mm -hmm. it not just agroforestry? But maybe we start with the term agroforestry. In uh, conventional farming, you usually work without trees or you only grow trees mm -hmm. and then you have your other crops in another place. Uh, agroforestry combines classical agriculture with forestry. So on one hand, uh, you grow crops, you grow your yam, you grow your cassava, uh, you grow your bananas, your papayas and so on. But you also in uh, include your, your lime, your lemons, your mm -hmm. avocados, your mangoes. So you inc include trees into your um, growing of the crops. Yeah. Right. So that is called agro agroforestry, the combination of shorter life cycle species with a longer life cycle of trees. Mm -hmm. uh, but this could also mean that you just have a row of trees of one species yes. and you have a bed of grains in between. Yes. The question is why you do that? Why do you add trees? Um, the importance is trees actually break wind pattern. Mm -hmm. And especially in the Caribbean islands, we, we always have these, we are the, the islands under the winds. So you always have a breeze, which is, nice on one hand but it takes away a lot of humidity over the fields and with that you need more water to to irrigate your crops absolutely uh, so the evaporation rate is very high if you have trees only on the sides for example you already break wind patterns so humidity stays over the fields way more mm -hmm. and that already is a, a reason to go into agroforestry yes but then on the other hand the trees are very active in 
photosynthesis, so they bring nutrition into your soil, they actually improve your soil. Mm -hmm. And in syntropic farming now, we increase the type of species. So we go very strongly into polyculture and we choose them by their life cycle. So we want short life cycle, medium life cycle, long life cycle species, so that you can increase the amount of species on the same area of land. Mm -hmm. So um, you do not need that much land to still produce a lot, a lot of uh, yield. And you harvest fruits one day and you harvest timber one day or fibers or medicinals mm -hmm. in one place. Um, what we try to imitate is a natural forest. Right. If you so create a... Um, so sorry? Biomimicry is the other term that I, I mentioned. Exactly. So this is yes. what we're explaining yes. here. Is by mimicking the forest, you exactly. are creating a system which mimics what nature would normally produce itself, how a forest exactly. would its various levels of canopies. Exactly. So, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I cut you there. <laughs> um, to, to bring it back around, so, we've, so we, we have a concept of what um, conventional agriculture is. Everybody knows what that one is. So you've yes. explained agroforestry. Can you explain to us a little bit about how that becomes regenerative? How is it that that, so we, we are creating systems that mimic nature. Why is it that that is regenerating the land for our viewers? Okay. If you go into a natural forest, there is nobody weeding, there is nobody watering, there is nobody bringing fertilizer. The whole system is within itself functioning, so you don't need external inputs and everything. So it's, it's a functioning system. It has different layers, it has species of different life cycles, uh, and in that it is really perfect. Mm -hmm. um, when we start in syntropic farming with the first species we, we plant, um, they actually fulfill the role of improving soil quality. Right. So with these early plants, which normally would be weeds, imagine there's a, a landslide or there is a tree falling in a forest. As soon as there is an, like an open wound in the soil, weeds come up. Yes. That is what farmers usually hate. Now you have to go yeah. weeding, you have all these weeds. But the weeds is, an, is a natural process that now starts to cover the soil mm -hmm. and to, to bring the uh, aggregates of the soil together and to bring air in the soil and water in the soil. They actually prepare the, the soil life and the soil structure for future species to come. And that was what we're doing in syntropic farming. We mimic that, but we plant our weeds, the weeds that we prefer, um, salads, lattice, for mm -hmm. example. A lattice is originally, the original plant is a classical weed. You find it everywhere. Mm -hmm. We just found that it's tasty and we changed it a little bit in shape and, and volume. And then um, from there on, we started to eat it. So instead of having the natural weeds coming up, we plant our weeds that we can harvest and eat. But with each species, we increase the quality of the soil, the water holding capacity of the soil, the soil life becomes richer and more diverse. And that way we actually regenerate the soil and the climate due to the fact that we have the trees. So we keep more humidity, which is not blown away as usually or aerated. Um, and the whole system becomes more healthy and the whole yield becomes more healthy. Absolutely. So it is regenerative because of the health of the system as a whole. So what exactly. we're doing here, we are regenerating the soil itself, creating a, yes. a more healthy system overall, increasing the biodiversity, and you're planting everything. So you, you are growing yes. fruits and timber and uh, crops, and you are growing your mulch, and you are growing your salads and exactly. your tomatoes at the same time. Um, it sounds exactly. amazing. Uh, so maybe we can <laughs> delve a little bit more into the process. How, how, what, what does this look like and how do we do it? Um, permaculture evolved around a set of principles, many of them parallel yes. those in Syntropy. Um, so just to make sure that we can all grasp an understanding of the principles of um, Syntropy, 
can you paint a little bit of a picture of what that looks like in a system? So, um, yes. The, can you elaborate a bit on what the principles are and how you apply them in your landscape in Antigua, particularly? Yes. Um, now it becomes a little bit complicated. <laughs> when we talk 15 principles, uh, I guess we will not have the time to cover them in one hour. Um, but what I would like to distinguish is um, we have these 15 principles which give us a way at looking at nature because we choose how we look at nature. If we see two plants very close together, uh, we could look at it and say, oh, they're in competition or this plant drinks the water of the other plant. So we need to remove one in order for this one to thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, so in these 15 principles, we describe basically the mindset that we have towards nature that we say, actually the two species are in collaboration with each other and not in competition. And when you start seeing how these systems evolve and that there is actually not this competitive behavior going on these principles help us to see that and see this is all interconnected so the principles talk about functioning about the relationship between the elements of a system so i'm not only talking plants i also plan, uh, talk about the insects the the birds the humans that are integrated in the system um, and the the instrumentality we always say life on earth is like one big organism mm -hmm. and everything within it has a function to fulfill. And that's the same way how we go into, into designing systems for planting. And that's the viewpoint. So we see collaboration as one of the very important um, principles. Um, and the other one is that the system has a need to complexify. So we help the system to complexify by adding this diversity of species by um, designing plants in the life cycles. So that's still very complicated when you look at it. <laughs> Let's go down into, into, into how you go about or how do you see that this is a syntropic system? What is mm -hmm. typical in this terms of the practices, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So um, one very important thing is we try to strengthen photosynthesis in the system. Mm -hmm. Photosynthesis is the core process plants use to complexify their surroundings. They are able to harvest sunlight, turn it into sugars, feed uh, soil organisms, grow fruits, feed us, feed animals. So they're like the entry point in our whole life system on the planet. And um, we start by by planting species along the timeline, so short cycle, longer cycle, mm -hmm. very long cycle, mm -hmm. and in their exact strata, we call it a strata or a layer, mm -hmm. where we mimic the forest, um, to give each plant the right well-being, this bubble of well-being we talked about. So each species has a very specific need for light, for example, which we respect. I see this extremely often in the Caribbean, when you go into a field, you see bare soil, you see humps planted, species quite far apart, usually monocrops. It is a system that has evolved over generations and it's been used. And when you change it in a system that is syntropic, it would mean that you mulch heavily, mm -hmm. shape the soil very specifically so it can uh, harvest dew, for example, so you have more humidity in the soil and make sure that when there is rain, the rain goes towards the plants. Um, you plant species very closely together. You um, choose species that have a function in a system. We know, by, uh, for example, that cacti are able to harvest humidity from the air, right? So in semi-arid situations, which we have on certain islands, look at mm -hmm. Curaçao, for example, um, where you really are in arid systems or areas on the islands that are super dry, uh, cacti can help us to bring humidity, harvest it from the air into the soil and make it available to the other plants. Right. So we choose plants that are not logic in the first place. You would say, what is, why do we have cacti in a system? 
Or for example, why do we work with grasses so much? Mm -hmm. Because they become our fertilizer in the system. So um, we work strongly with the timeline, the strata, the dense planting. We prune a lot. That is definitely something that is uh, distinguishing syntropic farming for almost any other technique. So pruning means we strategically cut trees and plants to get our own fertilizer back on the soil yeah, to cycle nutrients. Drop and drop. Exactly, exactly. The, spe the special thing about the pruning in syntropic farming is that we specifically choose a moment in time because when we prune trees at a certain time of the, the year, beginning of raining season, uh, they release a growth hormone into the soil, mm -hmm. which gives the whole system a growth pulse. Right. And, and that is something that um, I have not seen in other techniques. They, no. Yeah, they do chop and drop, <laughs> but not in this, with this idea of, of creating yeah. a growth. It's that timing that really uh, I separates syntropy from any other system that I've seen so far. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. Absolutely. Uh, so I suppose <laughs> syntropic agriculture, uh, being very similar to permaculture and any other regenerative farming practices, which is what we've been discussing, um, uh, conventional agriculture is what our farmers have been accustomed to. We yeah. can see clearly right now, especially thanks to our current pandemic, that our food security, yeah. it's, it's not just about having a food security issue, it's about feeding our communities in a healthful way exactly. um, while building up the ecosystem and preventing any sort of a future collapse or uh, to build the immunity of both the landscape and our families and communities at the same time. Um, this is one of the things that should be a priority for us. So to make use That's of okay, a so. lot of the syntropic uh, uh, goodness me, this intro, this intro, <laughs> sorry, that you've been discussing, um, the chop and drop, the bringing water in, the different layers, biomimicry, all of those things, to change the way that we have done that for so many years. Yeah. Um, we're fighting a bit of an uphill battle with our conventional farmers. Yes. So if you could Very motivate... True farmers to transition from conventional methods over to syntropic agriculture, what would your three top reasons say be? <laughs> um, farmers, in my point of view, lack prosperity globally. I mean, let's talk especially to smallhold farmers, which is typical for the Caribbean. They lack prosperity. It's a hard job and you want to make your dollars. Um, so dollars is one aspect to actually transition from <clears throat> classical conventional farming to syntropic farming. Why is that? Hmm. As we grow our own fertilizer, we do not need to buy fertilizer. As we have systems that are designed in a way that they actually avoid weeds and avoid pest attacks, your um, cost goes down. So you don't need fertilizer, you don't need pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. Um, the systems, when they start up, they are a little bit finding their way they need to find balance and usually once they're in this balance they become very resilient to to any kind of uh, pest attacks so you save money um, in Antigua I had I was working with a farmer and he had a little bit more than uh, we had three hectares of land three acres of land sorry and he had ginger planted and I asked him why did you plant ginger what was your motivation to plant ginger and he said well it takes a long time and there's not many people going through all this waiting and then you have to dig them up and then I can make my dollars. And that's good because there's not so much ginger on the market. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree with you. But what if you're in this waiting time until you can actually harvest your ginger, you could also sell lettuces, uh, arugula, um, papayas, and so on, also, that you have species yam in, the, in between, the cassava. And the, the reply was very easy. It was like, well, they're in competition. I cannot plant them amongst my ginger, right? And we set up a system in Antigua that he saw that you can actually very well plant the cassava and the yam and the ginger and the bananas and the papayas and everything together. And right. then he realized 
all the way until I harvest my ginger, I have already sold five, six, seven species. Mm -hmm. So money. instead of investing money until I can harvest, I actually already can can make some money all the way there. Mm -hmm. So money is a reason uh, to, to change. <laughs> the second reason to me is the increased use of space. You do not need that much space because you also go in three dimensions. You go up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third one, in my point of view, um, might be that you achieve, which is very important in the Caribbean, uh, way lower dependency on water as an input. We can create, if they're well-designed, systems that go to very low irrigation to zero irrigation. That's and a, that's a huge cost. That is, yes. 75% mm -hmm. of our fresh water on this planet goes into agriculture. Mm -hmm. We should use it to drink and not to, <laughs> to water. And, and, you know, if you have a bare soil, you lose about 80% of your water that you irrigate evaporates and is blown away by the wind. So all this water doesn't even reach the plants. And we could really in, in intensify the way we use water. Instead of irrigating the skies, we really irrigate the soils. So money. That's amazing. Money. <laughs> <laughs> money, less, less land, more abundance, and uh, less water. Yeah. That would be my top three reasons. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, I mean, I'm yeah. in. Everything that you said. Makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, the world that Centropy could provide, um, the way the farming works. I, I want to eat all the food, and and I want to leave, yeah. you know, my my kids and my the next generation with the type of biodiversity and resilience that it leaves in its wake. Yeah. Really. Um, so definitely. What's the catch? Can you tell the viewers about some of the hiccups that you might have come across along the way, lessons you've learned, uh, the downfalls yes. of, any of, of a syntropic system? Yes. Uh, I would say one of the biggest um, challenges is really this change of mindset. Because people are very used, which is normal. Your father has been farming like this or your, your ancestors have been farming like this. This change in, in, in practices is usually a very tough road to go. Because mm -hmm. you very quickly fall back in old um, viewpoints and old ways of, of farming. Um, Centropic farming comes with a, a degree of complexity. Mm -hmm. So usually it's not something that you, you take a book, you look into it, and then you go to the farm and you apply it. Unfortunately, uh, in terms of ease of use, it's not that easy to use. You really it's need really to... Yeah, you got, you got to see what, what is your land all about? Where are you right now with your land? What is your land able to produce? What is your market needing? And mm -hmm. what your resources do you have? Which, in my point of view, is a huge issue in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. finding high-quality seed material and planting material, um, or, or sometimes really to, to bring it all together. Because when you start a centropic system, we plant everything basically at the same moment. Mm -hmm. That's logistically a huge issue in the Caribbean <laughs> because you need your lettuce, your yam, your ginger, your banana slips, your cassava slips. You need it all together. You need your corn, your beans. You need to have them basically like on one spot and then you start planting <laughs> and your avocados and your mangoes and whatever you want. Um, and in the right layer and in the right timeline. So this, this setting up is, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Yeah. Um, that to me is definitely the biggest catch of centropic farming because it's, it's, it's a process-based farming. You need to understand the, 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 the life processes, um, how you cycle the nutrients and you need to learn to observe because it's not a field of corn Mm -hmm. which has a, a huge simplicity. You exactly know how much you're going to harvest, when you're going to take it out, um, you know how much you're going to have. So in a, in a high biodiverse system, you need, and that's what we're working on very strongly with Salford Forest Farms, is also to go into modeling, um, like in, in terms of a yield calculator, like when will I have how much of which? Mm -hmm. Right, and how much biomass will I produce with a system like that? Will it feed my system? Um, 
and that is that is tools that we still need and in certain areas of the planet because this is not a tropical it's although it says sin tropic some people <laughs> understand it's only tropic no it's not it's definitely a global thing mm -hmm. um so we, uh, we we need to understand how we can scale systems like that with mechanization because it comes right. with labor you know yeah. you need to take care of all these different species, you need to maintain these systems carefully for them to be very high yielding. And that is a question of learning. So the, the, the knowledge transfer is definitely um, a point that is challenging. Absolutely. But it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, if you're just joining us now, this is Wired's live living room sessions. Today we're joined by Ursula Artsman, uh, she's leading us in a discussion on syntropic farming, insights into regenerative agroforestry. Yes. Um, and so far, we've had our minds blown. If you are <laughs> joining us on Facebook, please feel free. We are going to be taking some questions live from the audience. Um, and we have, you can put your questions below the videos that you're seeing, and uh, we will attend to them as we can. So I'm wondering if we actually have our first question from the audience ready, and we do. So the question is from Maria. Is syntropic agriculture similar to crop rotation methods? I would definitely say no, <laughs> um, or only to a certain uh, point, because imagine you, you have your field, you have an acre of land, and you plant it. Uh, maybe I should try to give you a, a mental picture of what that actually looks like. Yeah. We have lines where we especially in the beginning, specifically have trees and crops. So you grow um, your mangoes, your cashew, your bananas, your papayas, your avocados, your soursop and so on. Um, but as they grow slowly, you have other crops on them. If you have yam, you have cassava, you have short cycle like lettuce and stuff. Mm -hmm. And in between those tree lines, you have an area that you use for shorter life cycle species, such as your lettuce, your broccoli, your tomatoes, your, your peppers. And these central areas, they could look like crop rotation because once these systems have reached the, the end of their life cycle, uh, we can decide what to do with them. Shall we replant them? Shall we um, uh, change the crops? Shall we... Um, add trees now or, or grass for example is also an option um, mm -hmm. so there it comes to the point where we rotate a little bit um, as trees grow we get more shade mm -hmm. so the pruning becomes important because there comes a moment where we cannot grow lattices anymore unless we prune the trees so that we have more light in the system mm -hmm. So crop rotation, it can be a part of it, but it's not your yes. typical, I plant all exactly. of one thing, reap that, take the plant out, and then plant all of another thing. Definitely not. Yeah. What we really put emphasis on is, you know, the plants have as alive subsoil as they have above soil. Mm -hmm. And I always I always think of a, of a, of a trading market as if you're on a, on, a, on a marketplace where somebody brings the onions, somebody brings that, somebody brings fab uh, fabrics and stuff. So the same thing happens subsoil. We have more life. The, 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 the area around roots is the life densest place on our planet. Absolutely. There are so many microbes around the roots. And there is constant trading for minerals, for, for, for all these nutrients that the plants need. And that we do not want to disturb. Because the stronger we build this marketplace, the healthier our system becomes. So we try to avoid to rip out things and put them back in. Absolutely. So the also, tropical crop applies. You don't necessarily yes. rip your roots out unless you're harvesting the root crop, of course. Um, exactly. But you exactly. are dropping and you're dropping. You might mulch on top of what was there, but the roots typically exactly. stay in the system to keep the soil healthy. In exactly. Um, that sounds easier too to be honest <laughs> yeah and in certain ways it's it's a lazy thing <laughs> in certain <laughs> ways it's very it's very uh, straining because you still need to do a lot it's still a yeah, absolutely um, a challenging job but it becomes very interesting it becomes mm -hmm. very very interesting absolutely so the next question we have is actually from youtube um where we are streaming live on our youtube channel Ooh. so our youtube 
uh, user is asking, can you explain syntropy versus entropy? Are they a variant as they are variant ends of a spectrum? Okay, um, now it becomes very technical. <laughs> or not technical on planting, but technical on uh, the principles behind it or the, the mechanisms yeah. behind it. Syntropic farming is called syntropic because the word syntropy comes up. So it's mm -hmm. actually syntropy is the, the one principle and the other one is entropy. Mm -hmm. Entropy comes uh, from physics. Uh, it's in the um, second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. which describes things that I always try to describe I tr try to describe it as simple as possible, as easy as possible. Um, I guess every one of you has been playing with Legos probably one day, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have those different Lego blocks. Entropy and syntropy are, are, they belong together. That's an important thing. It's not one is good and one is bad. Um, entropy would describe, you have your house built out of Lego blocks and it starts to decay. Mm -hmm. So entropy is the process of making something that was complex because you had all these different blocks in it and build something that had a use mm -hmm. and it falls apart into simple elements. Right. Syntropy does the opposite. It takes all these, these simple little elements, the blocks, mm -hmm. and builds something which is greater and bigger than this than That's each cool. single block right um, very right and that is actually what plants are doing plants are using the the um our oxygen that we breathe right and they use the energy from the sunlight and they use these these elements and make mm -hmm. actually tissue out of it and fruits and roots and everything so they are highly syntropic in their processes mm -hmm. and entropy is what we need in the fields in the mulch we That's need the decaying, yeah. we need to break in part so that mm -hmm. these single blocks are available in the soil again mm -hmm. to be absorbed by the plants and put together again to grow something bigger. So syntropy relies on entropy in order to maintain its processes. And vice versa. And vice it's like it. breathing. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot, right, you cannot just only breathe in. We also have <laughs> to breathe out. It's an, it's an important part. Very good. So if we have another question from our audience, uh, this one is from Patrick. Patrick says, this sounds like we should have been doing this for decades. What will it take to wake farmers up? What are the obstacles to syntropy? Yeah, we should have done that a long time ago. And we actually did it to some extent. <laughs> um, if you go to many indigenous species or very undisturbed cultures, you, you see a very similar form of growing or what in permaculture would call a food forest. Yes. Um, very high diversity of species and really imitating those natural systems. Um, what are obstacles to syntropy? Yes. Um, in some extent, it has legal boundaries. Mm -hmm. In Europe, for example, we have a law for agriculture and we have a law for forests. Yeah. So you're not allowed to grow too many trees and too densely on your farm otherwise it becomes a forest and then forest law applies and then you're not allowed to grow your lettuce there anymore mm -hmm. and all right so we have some legal boundaries that we need to break up to make sure we are allowed to grow not only apple trees but also poplar and willows and, and plants like this right. because we need also in in the tropics we need species like and now people will go crazy neem or wild tamarind, you know, where everybody goes like, ah, it grows everywhere. Exactly, <laughs> that's what we need because it grows fast. It's highly resilient in the drought times and mm -hmm. we can chop and drop it and use it as fertilizer. Mm -hmm. How do we wake farmers up? Once farmers understand that they're very eager um, to understand and learn it, but we also need to finance transitions basically because it takes, the farmer cannot just leave his field and then go into workshops and learn and learn and learn and learn. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have ways that the farmer has a productivity ongoing while learning these systems. And that's why we say we need localized learning hubs that are able to coach the people in this process, right? Mm -hmm. um, what still is 
missing or, or what we what we are gathering is data. If you talk to larger scale of farmers or business people, they want to see data. So efficiency so of these systems, like how much yields, yeah. and so on. Yeah. We do have data since 15 years. We have um, systems in Bolivia mm -hmm. um, with a focus crop of cocoa mm -hmm. that are uh, measured. And we see really great results. We see uh, a decrease in witch's broom on cocoa. Uh, which is the uh, it's, it's a fungal infection. So we, we, we see decrease in 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 pests in uh, diseases. We see a higher quality and higher yield, or at least the same yield as you would have if you would bring in all the fertilizer and all the um, the external um, the herbicides and so on mm -hmm. while growing other crops. What we need, what we really need, is is great examples. Small scale, medium scale, large scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Martinique, for example, we have a, a large scale uh, fruit producer, global fruit producer, who has uh, switched um, from classical banana plantations to now syntropic plantations and found out that they're highly resilient to the storms. Ah, very good. So we find out that there is a way that your systems kick in very quickly after a hurricane and are productive again. Mm -hmm. If compared to the monoculture, yeah, yeah, absolutely. On um, on that same note, we CPRI would have been hosting a syntropy workshop yes. with yourself later this year. Thank Unfortunately, you. due to our, our current uncertain circumstances, we have had to postpone yes. that for some time. But we very much look forward to have to hosting that. Hopefully. Uh, towards the end of the year, 2021. Um, but that will be a really amazing time for local farmers to be able to access this information yes. and see it in a hands-on way. Um, Definitely. At Wired's Walker's Reserve site in St. Andrew, we have certainly put some test plots in place already. Um, and I know that there are plans to do a few more test plots so that we can start to see a system as it's evolving um, and Definitely. have that show A for students and B for again, what you're talking about, to have a little bit of data to back yeah. what we're talking about, really. Um, exactly. And showcase it. Um, and you know, that what I really see is farmers learn from farmers. And that is the best thing you can do anyway. And farmers learn in the field. And that's where they should be. So we need to have a system set up where farmers can walk in, can see it, feel it, smell it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and become convinced because you can have everything on a, on a live discussion. You can have beautiful PowerPoint slides. It needs to be seen in the field. That is very important. Yeah, very important. And I'm very happy that uh, Babetis is um, leapfrogging that movement in the Caribbean together with um, Trinidad. Curaçao is already mm -hmm. advanced. We have systems in Martinique, as I said. Haiti has systems up. Um, yeah, it is, it's coming. I'm happy. <laughs> yep, we're, it's growing. It's a growing movement. <laughs> yes. So our next question that we have is actually from Trey Graves. Um, can syntropic farming improve food security? That's a very, very important question. In a moment, um, yeah. you know, I as I have I have lived in the in Antigua for several years, and I still have I have family in Antigua, and uh, seeing what they're going through right now is really scary yes. and that is not only Antigua that is applying to many many islands especially globally and many islands that have uh, focused on, on, on one income stream mm -hmm. or heavily focused on one in income stream as is in the Caribbean with the tourism. Mm -hmm. um, we now see it live what happens on these islands if this food security is not in place right and this, this shift towards um, tourism has left lots of land unattended. It's, it's never a big market to have a farm, you know? Um, so increasing that and teaching people in from backyard to, to larger scale to use their land and regenerate their land and regenerate their water cycle you know, bring up the water in, in the, the water table underneath. Um, that would not only increase, increase food security, that would 
increased complete resilience of these islands. I also see a lot of people in the in the Caribbean region with, um, if you look at the statistics, high blood rate, um, obesity, heart disease, diabetes. Um, we get a lot of imports from food sources which are not the smartest. Mm -hmm. They're not the healthiest. Sometimes food gets imported and lays in, in, in containers and is frozen and defrozen. And uh, so the quality of, of food is oftentimes very low in the Caribbean. So okay. growing it yourself would increase your resilience, your health as a society, as a culture. Mm -hmm. And it would increase your, your, you would have your own food and your own yard, mm -hmm. which decreases food waste, by the way. And you don't have to transport food from A to B. It might become an extra income for some families. So Absolutely. I strongly believe that even if you just have a backyard, you can start growing food towards syntropic principles. It's not always possible to do it all. And you cannot, if you just have a tiny, tiny, tiny build base, but um, even in- extent, Absolutely. I've, I've definitely seen examples of syntropic uh, farming in kitchen gardens at schools. Um, yes. So it's, it is definitely a viable solution. Yes. You can uh, increase the food security of your own home, your community, exactly. as you grow larger and become a farmer, your parish, your island, your- Right. So, right. And I, I believe what is important is that we also increase this community aspect of it to create community farms, because what I see in, in Antigua as, as an example is there are so many people that have never planted anything. Mm -hmm. And now they do. And they learn and they make mistakes and they learn. And I see that I am in a, in a forum online um, of the Antiguan new farmers or growers and mm -hmm. now they show pictures of their first harvests and they're so proud mm -hmm. so it brings people together they say oh i i have this seed and i have that seed can we can we exchange it mm -hmm. creates a, a good spirit in the communities as well and i think that is as mm -hmm. important as regenerating the land i think it's easier to get new farmers out in a situation where they're not standing in a bare soil hot field too i think that's one of the key exactly. things to getting new farmers yeah. out to grow something or to create something in your own backyard. It's, it's a very easy, a very easy sell. Exactly. Yeah. Sweating. You're still working, but you're not uh, <laughs> necessarily as hot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so our next question from the audience is from Leslie. Uh, hi, how long does it take to transition from <laughs> tra traditional to syntropic farming? So that's a very good question. I, I've had yeah. that one before in relationship to permaculture or to organic farming as a whole. Well, the classic path would be to attend uh, a basic training, a workshop, because it is important to also see the, the practices that we use. Um, one of them is, for example, uh, the way we plant bananas. We definitely plant them differently as most cultures uh, to make them growing back to roots so they're more resilient to wind, for example. And um, that is one thing to really get a practical, usually it's a five-day training, Mm -hmm. And then comes this point, you actually would ideally need somebody in your proximity who can guide you along as you can sort of then set up your systems and learn from them, which is always the best. But you might always get to a point where you say, why is this happening or what can I do now? Mm -hmm. And that's why it is so important that we start to get uh, regional knowledge hubs in areas like the Caribbean, so we can guide the people and give them, even online like we do right now, to mm -hmm. help people further on. I would say, basically, if you have a piece of land, if you have, I don't know, 20 meters uh, by 20 meters, you can start feeding your family within a few months. Mm -hmm. And the real transition probably is a lifelong transition because we imitate nature. Mm -hmm. So we reconnect with nature and we work with the living system. So there's always something to learn, always. The observation is a very important part in it. Absolutely. But, yeah. <laughs> and we should start with our children. As you mentioned before, the, um, the school gardens and 
that's where we should also start to, because we're still in this mental set of competition and, you know, this is bad, and this is a weed and this is a pest. Uh, we should learn to let go of these mental mechanisms that we have and start with the children because then they're way more open to accept diversity as a positive thing, not only between plants and animals, but also amongst skin color, race, size, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. that diversity actually is a, is a survival mechanism of, of nature. That's great. So thank you so much for your question. That last question came from YouTube as well. It's really great to see our YouTube viewers. Lovely. Questions Lovely. As well. I think <laughs> we probably have time for one more question from the audience, if we have one. This one is from Facebook this time. So Prudence would like to know, hi, <laughs> um, is it possible <laughs> Cuttings and air layering and young trees into a syntropic system. So you mentioned that we we always start by seed and we're planting everything at the same time. So that's yes. a good question about cuttings and air layering. Of course, we do uh, work with cuttings. Mm-hmm. Um, nature works with basically with seeds, right? Mm-hmm. And that would be the system which brings a lot of resilience. Cuttings are already a little shortcut. Um, grafting is a shortcut. So we, we try to get the system a little bit advanced. So we, we sort of push it a little bit. Usually there is a back push from nature that says, hey, hey give me my time. I want to grow in my, my, my pace. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, we work with cuttings. Uh, we use um, air layering to, to get new, new shoots from trees. That's definitely a method we work with, yes. What we, for example, hardly ever do is composting. That is something where, yes. you know, which is very, very high in, in uh, permaculture. Or... Composting in your fields, though. So you are... When exactly. You chop and drop my, my permaculture. Term, yes. You, your, your decomposing is happening inside your fields, inside your bike, exactly. by your mulching. Yeah. Um, and, but... and Brazil, all our kitchen scraps went just out into the field. Yes, yeah, it attracts it attracts animals, but they just do their job. They decompose, right. um, and the same thing applies to some extent with nurseries. So we grow our trees in the systems, and then we we thin them out as we see. You know, nature decides um, which is the strongest and the healthiest, and which is perfect for this one spot where it's in them, and that we try to foster. And the others we use as biomass. Perfect. Well, that yeah. sounds great. Uh, we actually have just one more question that we're going to sneak in. Uh, this one is from <laughs> Barney. Hi, Barney. Hi, Hi Barney. Hi, Barney. <laughs> <laughs> what is the name of the farm in Martinique that has transitioned to Syntropic? And are there any examples in the Southern Caribbean that might be worth visiting? Yes, Barney. Please go to Curaçao. <laughs> 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 or visit... Um, Wasamaki farms in Trinidad, they're already uh, experimenting a lot and, and setting up systems a lot. Um, there has been a workshop in Curaçao, when was it? Um, last year. And from there on, many people started to set up systems. The Martinique system has been set up by Ernst Gotch himself. So it's like a master's design. Mm-hmm. And that was in 2017. Um, I cannot recall the name of the farm there, but we could um, organize the, the, the details and post it somewhere. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. We will make sure that we do that. Uh, yes. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ursa. It's been really very enlightening. Um, I love the Appreciate content. it. Entropy. It's it's parallels to everything else that we do, um, and the the work that uh, that CPRI and that Wired has been doing at the Walker's Reserve site. It's definitely a uh, another step, another angle, another lens to look through. So exactly, we've very and we're, we're very integrative. It's it's not about. I mean, I've been I've been in Walker's, and uh, yeah. it is amazing. These uh, the systems set up there are permaculture. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the, uh, the, because I, I don't make these bone boundaries too much. And they're, they're, they're working <laughs> systems. Yeah. And then we, we just give it another angle and another try and see what, what happens now. And that's learn it. from nature because that's the important thing. Yeah. Perfect. Learning from nature is what it's all about. Anything that increases uh, resiliency, regenerates, exactly. and increases biodiversity. That's what we're going for. So 
what you can exactly. call it, what you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. And we very much look forward to hosting very happy. with you in the nearish future as soon as we can. Um, we would like to educate right. as many Barbadians about the concepts that you've been talking about today as possible. Um, in closing, I'd like to remind everybody that as we shift into our second phase of the government of Barbados's COVID-19 strategy, we're looking for you to tell us what you are able to um, what you're able to do in terms of watching our segments. We host these segments twice per week, um, and if you can go onto Instagram or our Facebook page. We have a couple of polls there for you to be able to indicate when the best time for you to watch us is. We want to keep you informed and we would like to uh, do that at a time that's convenient to you. On this Thursday at 11 a.m., Wired's Keisha will be joining uh, Dr. Sonia Peters as they keep the focus forward facing um, and look at planting for the future. So be sure to join Keisha at 11 on Thursday. And thank you so much for joining us uh, on both YouTube and Facebook, and we will see you on Thursday.